Good morning, everybody. Good morning, California. And good afternoon, good evening, the rest part of the world again. Uh, this is Yi Chui. I'm the uh, co-director of the Storage X uh, initiative right here at Stanford University, together with my co-director, William Chair. Uh, today, we will have two very outstanding speakers, uh, as usual, to give us the Storage X Symposium talks. We will have Professor Manthram from University of Texas of Austin, and also Professor William Chair right here, my co-director at Stanford University, to give us uh, the two seminars. Uh, professor Manthram is a professor in UT Austin. Also, he's the director of um, Texas Materials Institute. Uh, he has been very well known you know, over the last several decades working on exciting battery topic. Um, his work has been widely recognized. He's the fellow of Electrochemical Society, fellow of uh, Materials Research Society, and a fellow of um, Royal Society of Chemistry. The second speaker today, uh, Will, uh, is absolutely our superstar here at Stanford University. Since joining the faculty, he has been coming up a very novel and exciting approach to characterize the batteries, particularly using, for example, AI approach. Um, he's the winner of MRS, Outstanding Young Investigator Award. Um, he also won the award in the uh, <clears throat> Electro uh, Chemical so uh, it's a Society of Solid State uh, Chemistry. Um, he also now uh, leading a significant effort right here as a co-director of Storage X to uh, push the new direction, exciting directions of uh, the batteries going. Uh, with this, I would like to start with the presentation from uh, Ram. Uh, Ram, please go ahead. Thank you for the nice uh, introduction and for the invitation. My talk is going to be focused on richness and complexities of oxide cathodes for batteries. So it all started uh, in 1976 when 2019 Nobel laureate Professor Stanley Whittingham demonstrated the first rechargeable lithium batteries at Exxon Corporation in the United States, but, ha but by having lithium metal as the anode and titanium sulfide as the cathode. But right, cathode, it's hard to get more than 2.5 volt because we cannot lower the cathode energy level below the top of the sulfur 3P band. With 30 years of experience and expertise on oxides, Professor John Goodin of Tuop at Oxford started working on oxides because the oxide 2P band lies at a much lower energy than the sulfur 3P band, so you can get four volt. So that's how all the oxide cathodes started. So when you go from sulfide to oxide, yes, you can increase the voltage from say approximately two volt to four volt. Now, when you go from a simple oxide like Fe2O3 to a polyanion oxide such as iron sulfate or phosphate or even silicates, you can increase the voltage even further in an oxide because in these examples, for, for example, the FeO6 octahedra share corners with the XO4 tetrahedra, that is sulfate or molybdate or phosphate. So that means the oxygen is competing with both iron on one side and the X on the other side. So if the sulfur oxygen bond is very covalent, the iron oxygen bond will be less covalent or more ionic. Therefore, the iron redox energy will not be raised that much compared to in a simple oxide. 
So you increase the voltage. In these examples, for example, you go from three volt to 3.6 volt from molybdate to sulfate. And in fact, you go from less than 2.5 volt to 3.6 volt when you go from iron oxide to iron sulfate. So this is yet another way of increasing the voltage when you go from a simple oxide to a polyanion oxide. So there are now three major classes of oxide cathodes, layered, spinel, and polyanion family of oxides. And all the three of them were developed by Professor Goodenough too, started at Oxford, and then also carried out at least the third part at the University of Texas at Austin. And each one of them have their advantages and disadvantages. I have listed some of them here, but I will point out the major advantages. The layered ox oxides have high electronic and ionic conductivity. They are also highly dense, so we can get much higher energy density with the layered oxides compared to the others. But there are limitations with the cobalt. You cannot charge more than 50%. With nickel, there are cyclability issues. With manganese, stability issues. With spinels, Again, we get reasonably good electronic and ionic conductivity. They have good structural stability, but there are limitations on the cyclability. Polyanion, they also, the main advantage is the oxygen is very strongly bound by phosphorus or sulfur or others, so you get good thermal stability. There are also a wide range of materials with polyanion family. You can use very low cost metal ions like iron, for example. So those are all the advantages. The disadvantages are poor electronic and ionic conductivity. So you have to make them nano, coat them with the carbon. So at the end of the day, you get very low volumetric energy density. So these were the three families or concepts developed in the 1980s involving three visiting scientists. And none of them had overlap. Very interesting story. Mizushima from Japan came, worked on layered oxides with Jan Goodenough, left. Then Michael Thackeray came from South Africa, worked on spinel, went back to South Africa. I came from India, started the polyanion. Then I was the one who happened to stay, uh, come to UT Austin with Goodenough from uh, Oxford. And for the past 35 years, I have the privilege of see, seeing John almost every day. So I would say the three of us were very lucky to work with John in the 1980s to contribute to the oxide cathodes. So now today I'm going to focus on mainly the layered oxide cathodes. So the first question is, why do we have three metal ions, NMC, rather than one metal ion for the cathode? The answer is each one of them has its own advantages and disadvantages. There are two major aspects. The first aspect is the relative position of these redox couples with respect to the top of the oxygen 2p band. Cobalt 3 plus 4 plus overlap with the top of the oxygen 2p band. So it has chemical instability. For example, we used to do, my group used to do a lot of chemical delithiation 20 years back. So if you keep on removing lithium from lithium cobalt dioxide, the oxidation state does not increase below 0.5 lithium because you are not oxidizing cobalt anymore, you are losing oxygen. In contrast, you can go all the way to four plus with manganese and nickel. The other factor is, the stability of these ions in the octahedral site versus tetrahedral site. So if you take the difference, that will be termed as octahedral site stabilization energy. As you see here with the six electrons in the low lying T2G band, cobalt three plus loves octahedral site, it hates tetrahedral site. On the other hand, manganese has very low stabilization. It can move very easily from the transition metal layer through a neighboring tetrahedral site to the octahedral site in the lithium layer, transitioning from layer to spinel-like phases 
voltage fed all those which we do not have with cobalt so cobalt is a gift there are a few other criteria cobalt is metallic others are not manganese is abundant and environmentally benign and manganese dissolves more uh, cobalt doesn't dissolve that much uh, when you charge uh, discharge if you look at it in all of these six criteria nickel is in between manganese and cobalt the important thing to note is chemical and structural stability manganese and cobalt are exactly diametrically opposite that's too bad but that's what we have and we have to live with that that's why we have the combination of n and c nickel can go all the way to 4 plus so we can get much higher capacity with nickel than cobalt also fortunately when we synthesize compounds with high nickel content we get high tap density that's good for high volumetric energy density even though nickel does not become metallic because we are operating with eg band rather than e2g band it is still highly covalent so you can get good rate capability in the battery about 50% of the material cost is from cathode and in the cathode cobalt is the most expensive and cobalt also has less uh, supply compared to nickel so there is lot of interest to get rid of uh, cobalt and increase nickel so that can also lower the cost but there are challenges three challenges when you increase nickel cycle instability thermal instability air instability that involves both the bulk and surface of the cathode as well as the interaction of the cathode with the electrolyte and species dissolving interacting with the anode so it's a complex problem and that's what my talk is going to focus so all the samples i am going to uh, present data were made by co precipitation of the hydroxides and firing with lithium hydroxide we can actually make any composition 10 kg of hydroxide precursor per batch nickel content anywhere from 0 to 100% we can also incorporate hard to incorporate or dope ions like manganese and aluminum during the co precipitation so all the data i'm going to show you they have secondary particles of 10 to 12 micron uh, and primary particles uh, one secondary particle is shown here so you can see how the primary particles are sticking together and they also get good get good nice crystalline faces i am also going to present all the data with pouch cell with graphite anode not with half cell lithium metal anode so very reliable so here i am comparing two cathodes nmc 811 80% nickel and nc no manganese with 94% nickel you can see the cyclability here first when you go from 80% nickel to 94% you get higher capacity that's why we are all interested to increase the nickel content but the cyclability is getting worse when we go from 80% nickel to 94% nickel if you look at the cycle life if you really look at large number of cycles like 1500 cycles then the 9406 fares much more compared to 811 so now we need to understand why of course we keep the cutoff voltage 4.3 as you increase the nickel content the voltage slightly decreases so with the same cutoff voltage you can get higher capacity with a higher nickel content compared to with a lower nickel content that means when you charge it you get that is parameter changes in the c parameter so that creates cracks when you create cracks you also create new surfaces so interaction of the cathode surface with the electrolyte is keep on continuously increasing as we cycle so this shows a comparison of an sem evaluation or inspection of the two cathodes after 1500 cycles so as you see here initially you don't see much difference but if you take the cathode out after 1500 cycles 
there is much more cracking degradation in the 9406 material compared to the 80% material. So more pulverization, more surface reactivity. So that's just the bulk. We have also used time of flight secondary and mass spectrometry. That has the unique advantage of producing characteristic lithium bearing ion fragments, depending upon which compound you have. So that can help us to have a better understanding of the interfacial reaction between the electrolyte and cathode. One important aspect is, supposing if you have metallic lithium on graphite, you will get a lot of Li3 clusters compared to other compounds. So that's a way we can detect whether metallic lithium is deposited on graphite or other components. In addition to that, we can sputter and we can see as you keep on sputtering how the components are changing and you can also use uh, isotope enriched cathode and you can understand the cathode electrolyte interaction. This slide is important. So we are comparing the SEA thickness on the graphite. So the only difference is in one case, 811 cathode, another case, 9406 cathode. Everything else is same. So we are now, by sputtering, see how much depth we have to see go to see the graphite as a function of cycle number. 811, after 1500 cycle, you have to sputter this much to see the graphite. 9406, you have to sputter that much to see the graphite. The scale bar is here, so you can kind of compare. So that means the graphite has much thicker SEA layer when it is paired with 9406 compared to 811. Only the cathode is different. Anode is same, everything else is same. Also, the amount of nickel deposited on the graphite after 1500 cycle is much more when the graphite is paired with 9406 compared to when it is paired with 811. So metal dissolution increases with increasing nickel content and metal deposition on the anode because of crossover also increases with increasing nickel content. Safety or thermal. So to compare the thermal stability, we have to charge them to the same capacity, otherwise it, it will not be a good comparison. So this is after charging to 220 milliamp hour per gram. As you see here, when the nickel content increases, the thermal stability decreases. That is understandable. Manganese has all kinds of oxides, two plus, three plus, four plus oxide. Cobalt has only two plus and three plus oxide, no four plus. Nickel has only two plus oxide, not even Ni2O3. Therefore, nickel is much more unstable in contact with the electrolyte. So that's why the stability is decreased. In addition to that, the biggest headache at the industry with the high nickel compounds is lithium comes out to the surface when you keep the material at ambient condition in air to form lithium hydroxide or lithium bicarbonate or lithium carbonate, as you see here, these little green things. So that's called residual lithium. If you have too much of it, it creates problem clogging to make electrode. It also degrades the performance. So residual lithium increases exponentially with increasing nickel content, exponential. When you go from 60 to 80, already problem, 80 to 90, much more problem, 90 to 95, even more, 95 to 100%, much more. So it is exponential as you see here in this plot. So what do we do? Are we stuck or can we do something? Yes, of course we can do something. So we are comparing here the same 9406 without any aluminum and here with 2% aluminum. You can see as soon as you put aluminum, we get much better cyclability, the red curves. We also get much better voltage stability. Why? If you do not have much aluminum or do not have any aluminum, you have more nickel crossover to the graphite compared to the sample which has 2% aluminum. 
and that also lead to more trapping of active lithium on the anode compared to the material that has 2% aluminum. So aluminum, magnesium, and even boron or other dopants do a lot of magic to have a big difference in this. I'm comparing here the cyclability again, undoped versus aluminum and magnesium. Again, you can see doped samples have better cyclability. Doped samples also have better thermal stability compared to the undoped. I'm also comparing the performance after exposing the undoped and doped material to air. As you see here, the undoped material after exposing to air for 14 days or 30 days degrades much compared to the material with the 2% aluminum less degradation. So what is the magic with aluminum or magnesium or other dopants? Of course, there are small differences in the energy level among manganese, cobalt, and nickel, but they have edge-shed octahedra. So the metal ions are directly seeing each other. So there is a good flow of electron, I would say highly delocalized system. The electron mobility is good. As soon as you put aluminum, you put up that electron delocalization or communication. The lattice becomes a little bit more localized the so-called Anderson localization physics community. So because it becomes robust, the metal oxygen bond becomes stronger and also mobility and electron mobility is decreased. Therefore, metal dissolution is decreased. So, so far I talked about doping, bulk stabilization. We have now surface stabilization by treating these oxides with oxygen 18 enriched phosphoric acid. The phosphoric acid amount is less than one mole percent, very little. So when you do that, that reacts with the residual lithium and forms a nice Li3PO4 layer on the surface. You can see from top sim's image. And the big difference you see is the cyclability, there is a big difference. The, the sample PNC means Phosphoric acid treated, NC means not treated. You can see much better cyclability when you treat the sample with phosphoric acid because the surface is covered with a nice Li, Li lithium ion conducting Li3PO4. We have also examined the samples after 1000 cycle. The rock salt formation is to a depth of 15 nanometer in the NC sample compared to three nanometer in the case of phosphoric acid treated sample. So degradation on the surface is decreased. This is the cathode electrolyte interfacial layer analysis with the top sims. As you see, there is much thicker CI on the sample which was not treated with phosphoric acid, and much thinner, 20 nanometer versus 100 nanometer on the sample treated with phosphoric acid. We have also charged the two samples to 4.4 volt and stored at 55 degrees C to see how the things change. The sample treated with phosphoric acid has much more stability on the voltage when you store at 55. And also after storing at 55, if you look at the discharge capacity, the phosphoric acid treated sample has higher discharge capacity than the other sample. So, Surface stabilization is important. This is the anode, uh, examination of the anode, graphite anode paired with the NC and the phosphoric acid treated sample. It's very hard to go through everything. Particularly, I would like to pay attention to the nickel. As you see here, the sample not treated with phosphoric acid has much more quantity of nickel on the graphite anode compared to the sample which, are, which was treated with phosphoric acid. So the sample treated with phosphoric acid has a nice sur surface protection. So that means metal dissolution decreased. That means you see less amount of nickel on the graphite anode. And also you see much thinner SEA layer on the phosphoric acid treated sample, 10 nanometer compared to 40 nanometer thick on the untreated sample. 
Now the next question is yes, metal dissolution is a headache. Why do they dissolve? How do they dissolve? Would all the metal ions dissolve? The answer is no. So it is an electronically driven lattice instability that leads to the dissolution. Particularly metal ions which have one electron in the EG band, they are ion teller active, they can have long range distortion or dynamic fluctuation, ion teller distortion. If you have that, then few things can happen. The MN3 plus ions can do charge ordering to relieve the instability. So one can become two plus, one can become four plus, once it becomes like that, the trace amount of proton present in the material can protonate the oxide and water can be formed and that can go away when the water goes away along with manganese. So that's how the manganese two plus goes into solution and then the dissolved manganese goes to the anode and causes all these problems. So only certain ions which have the electronic instability due to one electron in the EG band that causes dynamic or static lattice instability and they lead to manganese dissolution. So far I talked mainly about the cathode stabilization both bulk and surface but we have to also work with electrolyte. So for example, I show something here, some electrolyte having EC, this, this does not have EC, and we also change the salt. So the, when you do not have any ethylene carbonate in the electrolyte, that gives better cyclability, both at 25 degrees C as well as at 45 degrees C. It also gives better storage stability, the EC free, not only that, when you remove EC, you also get better thermal stability. So conclusion, we cannot simply work with the cathode alone. We need to work both the cathode bulk, surface, as well as the electrolyte to have a good performance. So ultimate goal is to eliminate completely uh, cobalt. So we have been successful to completely remove cobalt with a 90% nickel. 5% manganese, 5% aluminum. That just came out in advanced materials uh, last week. So we are comparing a series of compounds here. Only NMA here does not have any cobalt. Others have a little bit of 5% cobalt. You can see the NMA cycles well compared to same as 622, but 622 has lower capacity. It cycles better than some of the cobalt containing composition. Usually people will be worried about rate capability. We do not see any compromise on the rate capability when we completely eliminate the cobalt and also safety. We do not see any compromise. Actually, in fact, the thermal stability is better compared to some of the cobalt containing compositions. So the answer, cobalt can be completely eliminated from these layered oxides as we move forward. Now, a couple of slides. So, so far I talked about lithium layered oxides. There's a lot of work going on with sodium layered oxides. We will have a lot of similar problems as we have with lithium layered oxides. On top of it, we may also have additional complication because sodium prefers both octahedral and tetrahedral, or sorry, trigonal prismatic coordinations. Therefore, they can very easily slide the layers. So you can get O3 to P, P means sodium is in the prismatic, O means sodium is in the octahedral. So those kind of transition can happen, which is to a lesser extent in the case of lithium. Multivalent ion, again, oxides are useful, but close packed oxides, if we take multivalent ion diffusion is a big problem. Sometimes in my group, we do simple chemistry experiments to learn a lot, for example, if you have LiMn2O4, treat with the NO2BF4, you can remove all the lithium out, no problem. If you have same structure, everything same, you have MgMn2O4, treat with the NO2BF4, no magnesium can be removed. X-ray pattern you can see here, you can analyze mag magnesium content, nothing happens. Why? Magnesium 2 plus has a hard time to move from the tetrahedral side 
to a neighboring empty 16C octahedral site to the next tetrahedral site, so it doesn't want to move. So in close pack structures, diffusion will be a problem. Also, in these materials, if you have trace amount of water, proton may be inserting in these materials rather than multivalent ion. So one needs to be careful to employ a series of different characterization techniques to have a good understanding of whether it is really proton or multivalent ion. If you go to more covalent systems like sulfide, then you can have better possibility, you can, but then the voltage will decrease. Finally, conclusion, nickel is the only candidate that can eliminate cobalt without sacrificing the capacity or energy density, but they have cycle, thermal, and air instabilities that increase exponentially with increasing nickel contents. Capacity fade is due to both cracking as well as surface reaction and dissolved metal ions go to the anode and cause problem. Doping helps, surface coating also helps. Again, compatible electrolytes will also help. When you go to sodium analog, similar problems can be there. Lot needs to be understood with sodium, metal dissolution, long-term cyclability, multivalent ion, diffusion limitations, proton versus multivalent ion insertion we need to worry about. And finally, I would like to thank all the people who have worked with me, more than 250 people over the years. They are spread all over the world. I'm very, very grateful to all of them, as well as funding agencies, particularly Department of Energy, VTO and BES, and other agencies for funding our work. Thank you very much. Well, Ram, thank you very much for the excellent talks on the cathode. Uh, the questions are coming in, a lot of them, I think a lot of inches from audience. Uh, let me start from the first one. Um, there's a person asking, how does your co-precipitation synthesis of MMC compared to industry method? Is it a, there's a big difference or it's basically the same? So industry does exactly same kind of co-precipitation of hydroxides and firing with lithium hydroxide. Our synthesis is exactly the same, excepting we have capability in my lab up to 10 kilogram per batch. Of course, industry will do probably tons. <laughs> That's the only difference, but there is no other difference. It can be translated to industry without any problem. It's the same kind of method. Okay, so the second question related to the oxidation state of nickel. And lithium nickel oxide, uh, the working couple is nickel four plus to three plus. But in uh, MMC, the nickel couple is four plus with two plus. Uh, why doesn't the MMC involve in nickel three plus? So when you have NMC, when you have manganese and nickel, on paper we can write manganese three plus and nickel two plus, but the nickel three plus will oxidize manganese three plus to manganese four plus internally, and nickel three plus will get reduced to nickel two plus. This is during the synthesis. If you have 10% nickel, 10% manganese, that 10% nickel will go to 2 plus, and then correspondingly manganese will go to 4 plus. So in those materials, first you will, when you charge, oxidize the 2 plus to 3 plus, then you oxidize the 3 plus to 4 plus. Okay. If you have LiNiO2, if there is no oxygen vacancy, and if the lithium to nickel ratio is exactly one to one, then everything will be three plus, but that's very hard to get. You'll always have a little bit of oxygen vacancy or a little bit of lithium deficiency. You will also have a little bit of two plus in LiNiO2, depending upon how it is synthesized. Okay, the next question, uh, Ram. Um, so you show the data of, uh, you know, this lithium trapping and the anode. Uh, the audience asks, how does this lithium trapping link to the nickel dissolution problem from the cathode? The more nickel dissolves, the more 
catalytic reduction of the alkaloid so you have more sci formed the more sci formed on the anode the more trapping of active lithium so it all starts at the cathode if you have more things dissolving at the cathode they migrate cross over to the anode when they go to the anode there is more decomposition of the alkaloid going on because of catalysis and you have thicker SCA layer on the graphite anode that leads to trapping of active lithium. So you keep on getting less and less cyclable lithium. That's why capacity fades. It's very clear. Yeah. Both so, manganese and nickel. So Ren, to mention one information to you, I completely agree with your uh, I mean, observation. Uh, recently, we used uh, cryo EM to look at the nickel dissolution problem and deposit on the anode. Uh, that's the case for uh, lithium metal, and then we see a uh, significantly thicker SCI once you have nickel uh, precipitate on the end. Now, I presumably that would increase the impedance. Actually, we have seen that, and then uh, that can trap lithium. Completely agree with uh, what you just said. And this leads to a, a similar question uh, Is nickel manganese? Uh, consider worse for the anode of SCI? I think the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, how does it change if you go from graphite to silicon to metallic lithium anode? Uh, how does this nickel or, or manganese dissolution? Okay, uh, that has not been, we have done, uh, the community has done a lot of work <laughs> with cathode and graphite anode because we are making money <laughs> we can't, yes, we are beginning to make some money, but I think the work has not been done. We need to do similar work. That is a battery 500 job to do that uh, with lithium metal. And similar work should also be done with silicon. It's an interesting aspect. We need to compare graphite anode, silicon anode, or silicon carbon composite anode, and then lithium metal anode, how they are different my gut feeling is lithium or silicon is not going to be any better than graphite, at least now. But I do not have the data. We are beginning to do some work pretty soon, but I don't have the data. But that is something which needs to be done by the community. Yes. Okay. Uh, Ram, next question. Uh, when you show this data on the air stability of MMC, when the nickel content goes higher, certainly the st chemical stability will go down. Uh, this audience is asking, well, how long do you need to uh, expose in the air, uh, basically doing the whole processing, for example, slowly processing and so on, how long do you need it exposed to, to the air? Start to see the degradation of this cathode surface. And I, I will add in one more thing is, uh, is it the water or is it the oxygen or maybe both uh, that affect this uh, chemical stability? Let me uh, answer the second question first. You have water vapor and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So it is water vapor and carbon dioxide leading to the formation of lithium carbonate, bicarbonate, and lithium hydroxide. The first question, how fast it happens? As the nickel content increases, it happens exponentially faster. <laughs> that means if you have pure LaNiO2, you synthesize, take it out of the furnace, keep it outside for five minutes, 10 minutes, you will already have residual lithium. If it is 622, much less. If it is 811, maybe it takes a little bit, not maybe, it takes a little bit longer. So the time, how long you can expose, actually depends upon the nickel content. And again, exponential, it is not linear. As you go to higher and higher, it goes faster and faster. So there is no simple answer. It depends upon the nickel content. Like I said, LANIO2, within minutes, you can see, because nickel 3 plus is not stable. It wants to get reduced to nickel 2 plus by forming all these hydroxide. And also lithium is mobile in the lattice structure. So it can come from the inside to the surface to do the stabilization, to do the stabilization. So, so Ryan, let me uh, go further on this question you mentioned. So CO2, uh, you have uh, water right there. So let's see if you eliminate uh, 
water by going to the dry room where reasonably dry, would you see this uh, uh, problem significantly uh, suppressed? Yes, that's correct. But the question is, how difficult it is to store in the dry room all tons and tons of materials, right? So that's the issue. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So next question, so you talk about the, uh, the open using magnesium and aluminum to stabilize the lattice uh, to you know, bonding the oxygen tighter. Uh, so what about zinc? Uh, okay, we have done work with the zinc. Uh, paper is being written. The zinc also has the possibility of a little bit going to the tetragonal side. Uh, sometimes a little bit, uh, but anyway, with the zinc, it's hard to dope too much, but the behavior is similar to aluminum and magnesium. Uh, but among all, we find aluminum is the best among all the dopants. So they're all more or less similar. They, all of them help, but aluminum is better than zinc. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Ram, you mentioned particularly aluminum doping uh, in, uh, in depth right there uh, and analyzing how aluminum affecting the electron hopping, right? The, the, the transport property right there. Um, so uh, this uh, person asked in, from the audience and say aluminum doping concentration is normally very low. Uh, why such low concentration can significantly change the electronic conductivity. Um, it is not the, exactly the macroscopic conductivity. It is a matter of, I'm very familiar with this because I worked on copper oxide superconductors in the 1980s with John Goodenough. If you take yttrium barium copper oxide, it will lose one oxygen when you heat from room temperature to 7, 800 degrees C. As soon as you put a little bit of lanthanum for barium, very big decrease. That means in these materials, the oxygen band and the metal band are close. There's a lot of covalent interaction. Any time when the metal energy and the non-metal energy, they are close to each other, highly covalent, it's very easy for the bonds to break. As soon as you introduce some localization, it's 1%, 2%, that's enough. It is introducing much more localization uh, locally. When you do that, everything gets kind of stronger and it dissolves less. We have the data. I'm, I, we have not done any calculation. That explanation is my gut feeling, having worked on a lot of oxides for the past 35 years clearly copper oxide superconductors, highly covalent and similar to some of these. So that's my, uh, I would say qualitative explanation. If somebody has calculations, some other explanation, that will be nice. Yeah. So right now, um, there are uh, several more questions. I think now broaden up the scope <laughs> of uh, not exactly what you are talking about, but related. Um, so you, you presented, uh, you know, this, lithium copper oxide, just, you know, MMC. And um, what's your thought about new cathode without cobalt or even nickel in there, the new cathode, any, uh, you know, prediction or insight to share? We have a lot of challenges. First of all, we have to stay with 3D transition metal uh, series. We cannot go to 4D or 5D because weight will increase. So with the 3D, if you are staying at the left side of the periodic table, titanium, vanadium, then your voltage will be lower. Their bands are up. So you have to go to the right side of the periodic table. There is no, no nothing else you can do. We are lucky with the nickel, the nickel two plus three plus, three plus four plus, couple overlap. So that's why that is the only uh, metal ion I know where you can have a continuous voltage profile when you go across two redox couple, two plus three plus, three plus four plus, you do not see a break. Of course, vanadium, three plus four plus, four plus five plus, you can imagine, but they will always have a step and that step can be 500 millivolt or one volt. So that's not good. 
So there is nothing else, as far as I know now, to beat nickel. Yes. If you want to go something else, you can go maybe Pali Anayan or something, but you will have other challenges you have to see. So as of now, I don't know of anything which can give the same energy density as nickel is giving with layered oxide. They also have high density, so you get higher volumetric capacity. Yeah. Okay. So next question uh, relates to electrolyte. Uh, this person asks, EC is the primary SEI, you know, formation uh, chemical, right? Is the is the reason uh, what can you remove, you know, get away from EC and having something else? To okay, so I am not an electrolyte person, but the electrolyte right now we stabilize largely based on the anode. We want to have something which works well with graphite. That's how we have been using EC. But when you go to nickel, uh, higher nickel content, you have to always worry about compatibility of the electrolyte with both anode and cathode. EC based works well with low nickel content and graphite. When you go to high nickel content, we actually use EMC. Okay, so we need to find out the compatibility between the anode and cathode. And of course, with the silicon and lithium metal, it will be different too, right? So that's where the challenge comes. So yes, when you remove EC, the graphite anode may be affected to some extent, but then you have to also make sure with that electrolyte, the high nickel also works. So electrolyte work needs to be more done with the silicon, lithium, and high nickel, the compatibility. Yeah, so, so when speaking of the SEI or CEI, uh, what's your thought like on the CEI? I mean, CEI is a highly, uh, I think, debatable. Uh, SEI has been clearly seen, but CEI, there's people saying, we don't see it. There's people say, yeah, we see it, right? I mean, when I say CEI, I understand the definition becomes vague. If your cathode surface has chemical reaction or electrochemical reaction, the cathode material itself can degrade into something else. And then there's also electrolyte decomposition, uh, compound go going on to the cathode. What I'm asking is the decomposition part of uh, uh, electrolyte. What, what's your thought about that? Did you see it? So we have done a lot of top SIMS analysis on the cathode with the different nickel content. When you have high nickel content, yes, you have surface buildup and they have various components. I had one of the slides earlier. You do see it is forming decomposition products formed on the cathode surface. Yeah. Like you have on the anode surface. It happens on both sides. Of course, if you have low nickel and limit the voltage, that will be to a lesser extent, you may not see it. So with that, I think uh, let's uh, move on to uh, wheelchair. Uh, thank you, Ram, and uh, we'll bring you back at the end. We'll have a 10 minutes panel discussion. Well, now sure. it's your, your turn. Thank you very much, E, and it's a great pleasure to follow Ram in this excellent, uh, in his excellent talk on cathode chemistry. So today I want to talk a little bit about the design rules for intercalation compounds for high valent and uniform redox reactions focusing uh, on cathodes. And today I will highlight both the layer oxides and the polyene anion lithium iron phosphate as examples. So first let me acknowledge the people who actually did the work. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with very talented students and postdocs as well as longtime collaborators. I want to highlight the contribution from Martin Bazant, uh, who performed many mathematical modelings of the process I will report today. Uh, solid state chemistry with Linda Nazar at Waterloo, density functional theory calculation with Gert Sater, uh, characterization work with Wan Li Yan and others at Berkeley Lab, uh, Saiful Islam uh, and other colleagues. Ram has already given an excellent introduction to the history uh, and some of the key problems for cathode materials for lithium ion batteries. And I want to begin my talk by highlighting some of the accepted design and engineering principles for lithium ion batteries. And throughout my talk, I will come back to these design rules 
and hopefully offer some new insights uh, and perhaps revisiting some of our assumptions. So the first design rule I want to talk about is the atomic level um, disordering of the material. So it's usually believed that migration of atoms other than lithium is problematic for lithium ion batteries, especially at the cathode. And the second design rule is that intercalation is generally limited by solid state diffusion um, in the cathode materials and minimizing interfacial resistance, uh, for example, at the cathode electrolyte interface optimizes for power density. Phase separation is generally bad for the lifetime of lithium ion batteries. So I'll come to each one of these uh, in, in the next uh, half an hour. So let me begin uh, by reminding everyone the motivation for the lithium ion battery cathodes. One of the biggest challenges is that as you remove lithium, the stability of the material decreases um, dramatically. And this is why we typically can only remove about half of the lithium from um, cathodes like lithium cobalt oxide, uh, the NMC materials, uh, and C materials. And this has a significant limitation on the energy density. So this plot just shows you the opportunity for increasing energy density by allowing you to delithiate further. But the problem is that as you delithiate and remove the lithium, the layer structure which enables the fast transport of lithium becomes quite problematic. So ideally what you want to have happen is you remove the lithium but the host structure remains stable. But in reality what happens is that as you remove the lithium, the material disorders, the transition metal ions and oxygen begin to move with the material, thereby causing the material to degrade, especially in terms of lithium transport. And one of the reasons this happens is due to the electronic structure that Ram already highlighted. As you delithiate the material, you are uh, oxidizing the material and lowering the Fermi level. And at some point, you're going to reach the non-bonding oxygen orbital and this process can lead to oxygen evolution from the material and a wide range of other degradation processes. So I want to first talk about how to stabilize the material against the oxygen from evolving and also talk about the link between oxidizing the material and the transition metals moving around. So there are three things I want to talk about. These are the three contributions to the link between the stability and what I call the high valent redox. So high valent redox means accessing very high oxidation states, very deep delithiation, and very high voltage on the cathode. This is very desirable from an energy density perspective. And in the schematic I'm showing here, um, you can see the energy diagram as I remove electrons from the system, you can remove electrons from the orbitals between the transition metal and oxygen, and uh, the electrons uh, can have various contributions uh, from both uh, the oxygen ligand and also the transition metal. And at first, this may seem to be the full story, but it's actually quite not the case. As you get to high oxidation state, the atoms have a strong tendency to form strong covalent bonding to stabilize the cell. And this is especially the case when you start oxidizing the oxygen ligands. And this is the driving force to form very short bonds between oxygen and between transition metal and oxygen. For example, in a typical transition metal oxide, you have about a 2.6 to 2.8 enstrom as the bond length between the transition metal and oxygen. But when you start oxidizing the material, this bond length can shorten dramatically. You can also form very short bond between oxygen atoms, uh, leading to the formation of what's called dimerized oxygen. When this occurs, um, the local distortion increases. You form very large local string energy because you have large, long, and short bonds. And this can destabilize the material, adding to the overall energy. But what really comes to save the day is that if you allow some disorder in the system, uh, for example, the transition metal migration, you can actually allow the string energy to be accommodated. And this is what I'm showing here. 
uh, on the right of the plot. And you can see these various modes of accommodating for the local strain. You can, for example, form a higher order bond between the transition metal. You can migrate between octahedral or tetrahedral site. You can form a link between the oxygen atoms. In some cases, you can possibly even form molecular species, the material. And all of these will cause um, different contribution to the total energy of the system. And let me be more specific here. So let me give you the example of the lithium rich NMC material. So on the left of the screen, I have the fully dilithiated material in which the atoms are in their perfect location. So you can see on the top view and the side view, all the lithiums have been removed. So now when we oxidize the material to a high oxidation state, the bond between nickel and oxygen or manganese and oxygen will want to shorten. But because all the atoms are in their perfect position, the energy penalty is very high because there's no flexibility in the edge sharing structure in the layer oxides. So this is the destabilization caused by the distortion of the bond. But on the right, if I move one of the transition metal from the metal layer to the lithium layer, this actually opens up a vacancy in the transition metal layer and this allows the strength energy to be accommodated. So on the right, you can see the density functional theory calculation. The bond between the metal and the oxygen shortens dramatically. But because there is a metal vacancy created by the metal moving out of the transition metal layer, the string energy can be accommodated. So when you compare it to left to the right, although you have paid the penalty of forming a defect pair, that is the transition metal vacancy and the lithium antisite, the overall energy is more stable because you're allowing the strain to be accommodated. So this is one of the key stabilization mechanisms behind why you're able to oxidize the material to a very high valence and have transition metal move around and yet have the transition metal not leave the material. And this is the ability to accommodate short oxygen bonding between metal oxygen and oxygen and oxygen. Another way uh, to view this uh, is to simply look at the coordination number between the metal and the oxygen. So in the left structure, each of the transition metal is coordinated to two oxygen, but on the right, the transition metal is coordinated to only one oxygen. So this decreased uh, coordination of the metal and the oxygen is one of the key stabilization mechanism, allowing more flexibility in the structure, thereby reducing the tendency for oxygen to depart from the material and stabilize it. So this is one of the key design rules uh, behind how to achieve high voltage cathodes. So let me come back to my slide on the design rules. So this table here shows the various possible modes of voltage degradation and hysteresis when you start increasing the voltage of the materials. So on the right, you have very irreversible process. For example, oxygen leaving from the material, you have completely irreversible transformations. The battery doesn't work. Then you have partially reversible disordering. So this is when your metal ions can move back and forth. You get a large hysteresis. And then over time, maybe some of the oxygen is lost from the material, so you have voltage fading. Then moving further to the left, you could have a situation where the transition metal can move around freely going back and forth between the lithium and metal layer. So you still have the large hysteresis, but there's very negligible voltage fading the material. And then finally, there could be a situation where the transition metals don't move at all. So right now, we are in the third column with the lithium rich material. We have some ability to move the metals around to accommodate the stabilization of the high valence state, but the hysteresis is large and you're losing material, losing oxygen over time. The most optimal situation will be the first column here where you have no cation disordering. At first, this seems really good, but the problem is if the transition metals are not moving around, then you lose the stabilization mechanism of under coordinating the transition metal. So we're actively investigating whether it's possible to stabilize oxygen in a high valence state or a, a transition metal in the high valence state without having the metal move around. So this is one of the curious outstanding point uh, on high valent redox. So let me come back to my list. So migration of other uh, atoms other than lithium is problematic. This is somewhat true, 
but it also can help stabilize high valency. So this is one of the design rules we are revisiting right now. For the next part of the talk, I would like to turn your attention to heterogeneity. So it's great to have high valent redox, but we also want to achieve it without heterogeneity in the material. And for this part of the talk, I'm going to focus on mesoscale heterogeneity. That is focusing on heterogeneity that happens at the nanometers and the tens of nanometers and the micron length scale. So let me briefly talk about the easily explainable heterogeneity in lithium ion batteries uh, in the electrodes. So there are generally two types. The deterministic ones uh, arises from transport gradients. So whenever you have diffusion limitation that can cause moving front within the battery, whether it's within a particle, within an agglomerate, or within the porous electrode. You can have temperature, pressure variations. You can have phase transformation imparting in compositional heterogeneity in the material. In addition to deterministic heterogeneities, you can also have stochastic heterogeneity. Uh, and Ram already alluded to this, is non-uniformity in the coding, the SCI. And all of these factors combined can have substantial impact on the battery performance. For example, local overcharging in the cathodes due to irreversible transformation SCI on the anode, you can have plating. Uh, as you increase the C rate, because the cathodes expand and shrink, and same for the anode, this can also lead to mechanical failure of the material. So these are what I would consider easily explainable, and um, all of us working in the battery field are are having a good handle on all these problems and developing engineering solutions. But for my talk, I will focus on what I would call the non-trivial heterogeneities. And this will arise from three things that are not as commonly considered. First, I will talk about population dynamics. So a lithium-ion battery electro consists of uh, many trillions of particle um, per gram. So we have to think about the battery not as a single particle, but as many particles working in concert. Second, it is widely appreciated in lithium-ion battery materials, especially on the cathode. The properties are highly dependent on how much lithium you have in the system. For example, the exchange current density and the diffusion coefficients are strong functions of how much lithium remains in the material. Um, and uh, this has very strong um, connection to the heterogeneity in the system. And then finally, I would like to talk about non-equilibrium thermodynamics. So a lot of the understanding of phase transformation in battery materials, whether it's the cathode or anode, is based on negligible current. But this thermodynamics will be modified when you start flowing a current in the battery. So we'll visit that as well. So I will try to give you an overview of how mesoscale heterogeneity develops within the material due to these three factors and then talk about some of the design rules that we can begin to apply to remove um, these heterogeneities. So let me begin with some unexpected observations. Um, I'm gonna use a very simple, very well-behaved system, NMC111. And when you charge and discharge NMC111, you would expect a solid solution behavior, which means that you can insert and remove lithium in a continuous manner without phase transitions. And when you do X-ray diffraction on this material, indeed, this is what you see. This shows you the lattice constant changing um, with the extent of charging and discharging. The top is charging, the bottom is discharging, and you see a continuous variation in the lattice constant, and charge and discharge is fully symmetric. This is exactly what you would expect. So this particular uh, diffraction was done in situ at a very low rate, and we're very happy with what you see here. Nothing unexpected. But when you start to delithiate at a very high rate, you begin to see something interesting. So here we're delithiating very quickly at several Cs. You begin to see what appears to be phase separation. So you see the coexistence of two lattice constant within the material. And you only see it on charging, but you don't see it on discharging. So this is a very unusual observation because one, the material is a solid solution. And two, you are seeing this very asymmetric behavior where this phase separation or what appears to be a phase separation only occurs on dilithiation. 
We're not the first to see this. Um, this has actually been reported quite a number of times in all sorts of cathodes in NMC A11, 622, NCA. Um, the first observation uh, were made uh, about a decade and a half ago and was also recently reported uh, by Karina Chapman and Clear Gray. And the simple explanation for this is diffusion. So here I'm showing you just a schematic what happens when diffusion is slow within the primary or the secondary agglomerate within the cathodes, you will begin to develop a moving front in the material. And when you do extra diffraction, I'm showing the diffraction on the lower left plot here, you can see the emergence of two peaks as you uh, delithiate as you charge material. When we run a simulation on charge, we don't have this problem. You have the um, expected solute solution behavior. It's very uniformly um, intercalated and deintercalated. So this is the current understanding that slow diffusion within the particle can easily explain why two peaks emerge at a high rate because you're really um, competing with the sluggish lithium transport kinetics at the C rate you're operating at. So this seems very plausible, but we want to dig a little bit deeper here and precisely identify the mechanism. As you can appreciate, X-ray diffraction is an ensemble technique, so we measure the aggregated behavior. We actually don't know where the lithium is going into and coming from. To get better insight into that, we need to have a mesoscale level view of where the lithium goes. So to achieve that level of understanding, we've been carrying out microscopy at the many particle level. So this is X-ray microscopy, looking at individual primary particles of NMC material. So now we can ask the question of not only what is the average behavior of where the lithium is, but also local behavior. So according to the diffusion picture, if you were to take the lithium out of the material, you have phase separation, if you let the material equilibrate, almost all the particle would have the same lithium composition uh, from the relaxation and the equilibration of lithium within the particles. If you don't let lithium exchange between the particle after relaxation, this is what you will see. And indeed, this is what you see when you charge slowly and discharge slowly. The histogram here basically shows you have some spread in the lithium composition represented by the colors here. And everything behaves correctly, as you would expect. But when you perform the experiment under fast charging conditions, so now we are removing lithium very quickly, you no longer see this unimodal distribution, but you see this multimodal distribution. In other words, we're finding that certain particles are full of lithium and certain particles are uh, devoid of lithium. And this only is found when you charge very quickly, when you charge, uh, when you charge slowly, you revert back to the standard unimodal behavior. So this was very interesting because that tells us that this apparent phase separation is between particles, but not within a particle. So this directly contradicted the diffusion limited picture, whereby we should find that all particles have very similar um, composition on average. So we were very puzzled by this behavior. So to understand what is going on here, we're also challenging one of the common design rule is that transport or diffusion of lithium in the solid state is rate limiting in the battery cathodes. So when we look at this NMC material, if you plot the C rate versus the voltage, you actually see an exponential behavior, which is very indicative of a charge transfer limitation. If you have a transport limitation, you will see the curve curving down rather than curving up. So this is some indication that diffusion is actually not limiting in these material. To further support that, if you perform your standard relaxation experiment, whether it's impedance or transient measurement, you can also measure the exchange current density. And there you also see uh, the same behavior is that you have a very strongly varying exchange current density. And if you compare this to the diffusion uh, coefficient, you find that indeed the exchange current can become limiting under extreme conditions uh, throughout battery charging and discharging. So if the reaction is limiting rather than diffusion in NMC cathode, how can this explain the heterogeneity that increases upon the rate of dilithiation and 
the heterogeneity only exists on delithiation, but not on delithiation. And for that, I would like to introduce you to the autocatalytic behavior of the interfacial reaction. So by autocatalytic, I mean that as you remove lithium, the exchange current density is getting higher and higher. So this is very similar to the diffusion coefficient, whereby as you remove lithium, the kinetics of the particles gets better. So this is what I'd like to show you here. We have a schematic of particles which have incidental inhomogeneity. This could be due to different particle size, variation, and coding. And what I want to see here is how does this heterogeneity amplify or decrease as you remove lithium. So as I remove lithium from the material, the kinetics is getting faster and faster and faster. This means that lithium will be preferentially extracted from particle that already has less lithium to begin with. So this causes the compositional heterogeneity between particle to grow. And this can explain the multimodal distribution of lithium as you delithiate. But as you lithiate, so as you discharge material, then the kinetics is in the opposite direction. So as you relithiate the material, then the kinetics is getting faster, uh, it's getting slower and slower. So what this means is that the incidental homogeneity actually will begin to decrease in the material. So this leads to the unimodal behavior. So in both situations, you start with the same level of inhomogeneity. But in the case of kinetics getting faster and faster on charging, then the heterogeneity is amplified. And on discharging, the same heterogeneity is diminished because the kinetics is getting slower and slower. So this is the effect of autocatalysis imparted by how the exchange current density depends on the extent of dilithiation. So why does this happen only on reaction limitation and not on diffusion limitation? It's actually very simple. When you have a reaction-limited intercalation, the particles themselves have relatively homogeneous composition profile. So that means the surface composition and the bulk composition are similar. And as you remove lithium, the composition on the surface changes. But when you have diffusion limitation, actually your surface of the particle remains almost in the fully dilithiated state on charging due to the diffusion front. So from the perspective of the electrochemistry, although the particle lithium content is different, the surface composition is actually the same. So this is what's leading us to equalize the composition. So this is a very simple picture to understand why reaction-driven process can control the growth and the retardation of heterogeneity in the layer oxide cathodes. So let me show you a video um, to, um, to illustrate graphically what happens. So as you remove lithium, you can see this uh, mosaic effect where particles are preferentially dilithiated. You see uh, in the simulated diffraction pattern, the bimodal distribution. You see the bimodal distribution of the histogram. When you run the same simulation on discharging, you can see the process proceeds very uniformly. Again, this is how the kinetics changes with the extent of the reaction. So this is done by uh, a multi-particle simulation performed by Martin Bazant and his student uh, Humbozel. This effect actually grows if you have transport limitation in the battery. If you have a very thick electrode, this effect is actually amplified because as you have a moving front, the local C-rate actually is increased for a given C-rate. And you can see this mosaic behavior occur on charging, but you do not see it on discharging. So hopefully I have given you some insights here on how heterogeneity develops within the material selectively on charging as a result of both interfacial reaction limitation and also on how um, the kinetic depends on the amount of lithium in the system. So coming back to um, some of the design rules, now we know the importance of the reaction limitation. We can make a plot of the phase diagram uh, under kinetic condition. This is a phase diagram showing you the C rate on the Y axis and the amount of lithium extraction on the X axis. So you can see that when you discharge, nothing happens. You're in a single phase 
solid solution uniform regime. But when you charge material, when you remove lithium, you can run into what we call this fictitious two-phase coexistence between particles um, under intermediate lithium regime. And this also depends very strongly on what lithium composition you access. In the layer oxide, it's very common not to fully relithiate upon discharging. So this two-phase regime will strongly depend on what lithium content you start with. So these are very interesting insight um, on the phase diagram uh, for kinetic behavior of the system. So coming back um, to the design role, so here I'm showing you that intercalation is not always limited by solid state diffusion. It can sometimes be limited by the interfacial reaction. And this can have strong implications on how heterogeneity developed within the material. For the last couple of minutes, I want to switch gears and talk about materials that naturally phase separate. So for example, lithium iron phosphate. In this material, the miscibility gap is very large. The material tend to have either full lithium occupation or no lithium. And we are asking the same questions here. How does the population of many particles behave when the material undergoes phase separation? So this is a, a movie that we have recorded of about uh, 500 particles in lithium iron phosphate in the porous electrode. As we discharge, you can see that the the, 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 the discharging process does not occur very uniformly and occurs in hot spots, okay? So you can see this in the dynamic video here. If I show you a static picture, you can also see that, that lithium is preferentially extracted and uh, inserted only at select particles. So the consequence is significant. This select removal and insertion of lithium in just a few particles means that very few particles, a small fraction of the electrode, is accommodating the current. So we find that um, the C rate locally and globally can differ by about 50 times. So if you are charging, discharging at 1C, uh, locally you can be charging, discharging at 50C. Uh, so this is a very uh, important consideration when you consider the stability of the material. So what's happening here? Well, let me first show you a movie. This is a simulation we have done. At low rate, you have this very mosaic behavior, which means that the extraction is proceeding non-uniformly. So you have what appears to be a popcorn effect. This is exactly opposite of NMC. So this happens at low rate. When you go to high rate, the battery actually becomes much more uniform. So again, the behavior is entirely opposite of NMC. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out this has everything to do with kinetics and thermodynamics. So when you have many particles in a system, you have to think about the behavior not only within a particle, but between particles as well. So this is a classical nucleation and growth problem for something like lithium iron phosphate. You have a large miscibility cap of two-phase coexistence, and you have a nucleation barrier. So what happens is in order for you to maintain a constant current, for example, as you um, discharge the material, you have to have a certain driving force to overcome the nucleation barrier. But in order for the nucleation to happen at a finite rate, you need to keep the driving force there. But as the driving force is kept there, that means as you enter the two-phase regime, you have a fixed driving force causing the phase transformation to occur. So let me show you graphically what happens. So when you want to charge at a low rate, your potential will be slightly over the nucleation barrier. You will achieve a desired nucleation rate, but the driving force will be very large because the dash line is considerably above the blue line. So this is the driving force for the phase separation. So you get a few particle proceeding very quickly because you have a significant driving force. And as you increase the driving force, you don't increase the rate of the phase transition. Instead, you increase the rate of nucleation. So the result is that you increase the number of active particles, but you don't increase the current per particle. So this precisely explains the population behavior we saw. We saw that the material accommodates additional current by increasing 
the uniformity of the reaction rather than increasing the rate of individual, par individual particle proceeding. So I'm a bit out of time here. Um, I would just um, end with this one slide. The observation that phase transformation depends strongly on the rate not only occurs at the many particle level, it also occurs at the single particle level. So here I'm showing you an image of the phase separated lithium iron phosphate at half um, lithium content, so lithium 0.5. And you can see the beautiful uh, phase separation into lithium rich and lithium poor region. And this is what you expect from thermodynamics. You don't see any um, composition within the miscibility gap. If you do this experiment uh, in situ, you can also see the moving front. So this is what happens when you're at a C over five, C over six rate, you have classical phase separation. But as you increase the rate of lithium removal and insertion, the material actually breaks thermodynamics here. And instead, you see the appearance of composition that's within the miscibility gap. So rather than forming this nucleus and growing, you actually see continuous lithium composition that goes through the miscibility gap. So this is thermodynamically forbidden. So you no longer see the phase boundary. And instead, you see a continuous filling and unfilling. So why are we violating thermodynamics here? Well, it turns out this has everything to do with the non-equilibrium thermodynamics of the system. Briefly, what is happening here is that the reaction the exchange current density, just like in NMC, also depends very strongly on composition. So the resistance is high at low and high states of lithium filling, but it is minimized at about quarter lithium filling. And if you consider this composition dependent reaction over potential, this can cause the phase behavior to change. So in lithium iron phosphate and any other phase separating system, you have this non-monatomic chemical potential or voltage that causes the lithium to want to partition into lithium rich and lithium poor distributions. But as you apply current, because the overpotential it is not fixed with the composition, the overpotential added to the phase diagram actually begins to skew the energy landscape. So rather than having a downhill uh, energy diagram, as you increase current, you actually cause the energy to become uphill. And when this occurs, there's no longer a driving force to cause the lithium to separate. So what I'm highlighting in yellow here is the composition dependent over potential. So when the resistance of the battery is dependent on composition, you can actually cause a phase separating material not to phase separate. In the case of NMC is exactly the opposite. So with that, let me just uh, conclude here and then come back to my design rules. Solid solution electrodes are more uniform than phase separating ones. Um, this is not the case for lithium iron phosphate, especially when the current is high. Minimizing interfacial resistance doesn't always optimize for power density. In the case of lithium iron phosphate, if you have a sufficient interfacial resistance, you can actually use the voltage drop to remove the heterogeneity due to phase separation. Five, um, as was noted uh, in the original paper um, by John Goodenough, um, phase separation can be a problem, but you can get rid of it by engineering the surface reaction kinetics. So with that, let me conclude and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, for the really nice talk about uh, understanding the phase behavior, understanding the electron induced the structure change in the cathode. So there are a number of questions right here. Um, so the first one is from Chris Chisi. Um, it's, uh, well, I think Chris asked this great question. Can you comment on the role of oxygen anion, oxygen anion repulsion when the interlayer is depleted of lithium cations, to what extent does this drive the rearrangement of the transition metals? 
Chris, thank you for the question. So actually, this is um, one of the very first hypotheses we tested. So it's generally believed that removing lithium itself will drive the transition metal to migrate independent of the oxidation state of the material. So what we have done here is to use simulation to guide our thinking. So we essentially remove the lithium from the interlayer, but we don't allow the charge to localize. So we put the charge in the background in our density functional simulation. And actually we don't see a strong driving force. So the empty lithium layer wasn't found to be the driving force for transition metal migration. Instead, what we found was that the combination of the covalent rehybridization between the transition metal and the oxygen and the point defect disorder, uh, that is what's really driving. Um, this is not to say that the interlayer being empty has no effect. It's a contribution, but it is not the significant contribution. So actually, you can also see this because there's a way for you to decouple the oxidation state and the amount of dilithiation, for example, you can substitute with different valence state. And people do see that what is really important here is the oxidation state of the material rather than simply just the amount of lithium removed from the interlayer. So well, next question I think is for Julie. I think this probably is M the Julie from MIT. Uh, so what's the fiscal reason for exchange current density to increase with deletion of MMC? Is it stress? Is it CEI? And then a uh, couple with another person's question, I think it's related, right? This person also asked, you know, lithium diffusion coefficient MMC usually increases and then decreases with the deletion process. So I think I mean, the overall these two uh, people's questions are all about this hypothesis you have is exchange to current density depends on the de degree of deletiation. What's the physical origin of that? Well, yeah. Oh, well, thanks, Ju, for the great question. Um, let me first answer the second question. Um, so indeed, both the diffusion coefficient and also the exchange current density, or sometimes called the charge transfer resistance, both depend very strongly on composition. So generally speaking, um, as you delithiate both diffusion coefficient and the um, exchange current density increases. So the question is not the dependence, but the relative ratio. So it is usually assumed that diffusion always dominates uh, in this material. But what we have seen here is that the reaction, uh, the exchange current density actually um, is even lower, in, uh, even more significant in contribution at extreme high levels of lithium content. So in that situation, we see that the system is controlled more by reaction than diffusion, though diffusion is also strongly dependent on composition as well. And I would say this is a surprising observation. Um, these numbers are not very easy to measure. Actually, Yeming yeah, Cheng and MIT has made direct measurement and we have as well. And the electrochemical measurements I showed is supporting this. Because if you look at the IV curve, essentially your C-ray versus your overpotential, we see the resistance continues to decrease as you increase the rate. So this is very classical of a charge transfer limited process. If you have a mass transport process, then you will get a, uh, a current that begins to reach a, 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 a diffusion limited current. So we do not see that. Um, the question from Ju, concerns why do we have this particular functional dependence? Actually, this is just a very classical um, site exclusion argument. So as you start um, to uh, remove lithium from the material, you essentially have a site exclusion effect that comes into the kinetic prefactor. So this is your x over y minus x, and this can define a peak within the material. So you can think of this uh, as a simple entropic contribution to the reaction kinetics. So this is the fundamental reason why the reaction isn't constant. You need not to invoke any other arguments. Of course, mechanical contributions will influence the reaction kinetics and its composition dependence. Uh, CEI will as well. But even in the absence of any of those effects, just writing down a simple equation of reaction kinetics using a concentrated solution rather than a dilute solution and then counting for site exclusion um, 
uh, on the surface, uh, for example, lithium vacancies, then you can basically recover this very simple um, dependence on the lithium composition. Okay, hey, thank you, Will. So next uh, question, uh, I think blended together with uh, my own question, <laughs> also with the audience question. Um, so this whole analysis, right, heterogeneity right there, certainly uh, can be uh, affected by a number of external reasons. For example, I think from the audience, it, the, uh, this person is asking, so how about the heterogeneity, just the lithium ion transport through the electrolyte? I mean, I, I, I guess the, the thinking is, well, you know, the electrolyte vetting, right? And then as well as ion transport during charging and discharging, I think you show that in a thick electrode because this whole phase behavior propagate from top to bottom, just the availability of lithium ion concentration and the local heterogeneity of that. That's one right, aspect. The second aspect I'm also thinking, uh, there's also electron transport heterogeneity as well. You know, how good the contact between the particles uh, and in the whole electrode, some of them will have a little bit worse contact, some of them will have better contact. This will also create the electronic heterogeneity, right? There. This all mixed into the phase behavior. Yeah, what's your thought about this? Yeah, so this is, uh, thank you for the question, E. And this is why I showed the stimulation video. There are principally two big sources of transport limitation. Transport limitation in the electrolyte and transport limitation in the current collector. So this is basically your ionic and electronic wiring. So I would say that in terms of electrolyte transport, it's very well understood. All the equations governing diffusion limitation in the electrolyte has been thoroughly modeled. I don't think there are many surprises there. The electronic wiring, as you pointed out, is not understood at all. These materials are modestly good electronic conductors, but typically carbon additives are needed to improve electronic wiring to the particle, and the distribution is not uniform. So one of the key questions we're trying to think about now is, are we really always limited by ionic transport uh, in the electrolyte, or sometimes we can be limit, limited by electronic transport in the current collector? But to come back to my talk, what I wanted to show was even in the absence of ionic or electronic wiring effects, even without them, heterogeneity can still occur. For example, in NMC, even if you have no reaction, no diffusion limitation anywhere, you can still get this mosaic behavior just arising from the reaction dependence on composition. In lithium ion phosphate, you can get rid of the phase separation even without any transport limitation. So I think the main message here is transport limitation in the electrolyte and in the, in the current collecting carbon network is certainly always there and that's amplified at high rates, but you have to also consider heterogeneity that can occur within the particles, even without diffusion limitation in the solid state. Yeah, thank you, Will. Hi, Ram, if I can bring you back to stage, let's, uh, let's have a panel discussion. So maybe, Will, I can give you, let you take a one minute break. Let me ask Ram a question first in, in, a, okay. in a panel discussion. Ram, I'm very, uh, in, certainly I already know about this for a long time. Uh, you have, um, uh, you know, you've been working with John. Uh, you were John's uh, early on postdoc, right? I mean, this question is, I think, for the younger audience uh, uh, right here. And uh, you have seen this development starting from 1970 in the middle of like 76, in the middle of that stand, right, uh, of having this titanium sulfur intercalation mechanism, uh, you know, discover and also invented. And then later leads to oxide, you mentioned that a little bit. Uh, uh, John did this uh, uh, Nobel winning work, you know, on the oxide together with Stan and then uh, our Japanese uh, friend right there winning the Nobel. So what's your thought or what's your learning in the last several decades, you know, by working with John and then later you have your own independent uh, career and you participate in such important work. Uh, what's your, advice for some of the 
young students or young faculties, uh, you know, what, how, how to pick problem, you know, what, 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 any thought you, know, you want to share? I was fortunate to work with John. So all my degrees were in chemistry. So I am a chemist. I'm a solid state chemist. So when I came to John, I had the opportunity to work with both uh, cathodes or uh, electrodes for batteries as well as on superconductivity. So that opened my eyes a little bit to have the physics education. So that was very helpful. So if you want to work on material science, you need to have both chemistry and physics. That's the first advice. You cannot just do chemistry alone or you cannot just do physics alone. It doesn't work very well. Actually, John's trump card is, he's a physicist, but he was always fond of working with chemistry postdocs or chemistry scientists. And he was always able to work at the interface between chemistry and physics. And that's how he was able to make some unique contribution compared to anybody else on earth, I would say. So that is essential. Number two, when you work, you never know which will be <laughs> having an impact or, or which will not be having an impact. Normally when you work, uh, all the work we did in the 1980s, we were all interested from a point of view of publication rather than expecting that it is going to be <laughs> in somebody's cell phone or <laughs> car one day, it was not like that. So it's very hard to say, but these days everything is crowded. So my advice to students and uh, young faculty, maybe it's a good idea not to work on <laughs> areas where there is too much crowd, then you may not be able to make an impact. You may work on some areas which may not be too hot, but you believe that it will make a big contribution as we move along. 10 years later, you will be recognized much more than anybody else. So you may want to think about it. Otherwise, too many people work, too many experienced people. So it's very hard to know now who did first, who did next, right? It's like that. So you may want to keep uh, that in mind. So some unique areas uh, that may be useful. Now, Ram, this is really interesting insight. I wish I, I could talk to you earlier about your comment on this. <laughs> you are doing great. You, it doesn't apply to you. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is, uh, you know, uh, when I uh, joined Stanford faculty, I coming from the nanoscience community, I wanted to find an area that's not as crowded 15 years ago. Uh, it was actually the battery one. So using my nanoscale expertise. It's very interesting, your comment. Now, me, let me link back to Will. Well, you're, you are exactly the, the case, uh, I think opposite to what Ram just said. <laughs> uh, uh, when Will started, I mean, this is very interesting, this all kind of successful case. Uh, when uh, uh, Will joining the faculty, you know, when even just come to visit, I can spot right away, this is a superstar. Uh, uh, will you go into area, let's say MMC, it's already many people. I think when you started, many, many people and then you, you go in, you have very unique insight. You know, you discover many things people probably didn't think about before or didn't think deeply about before. And having a lot of major uh, discovery right there. So what's your thought like? You are going kind of like <laughs> with a Ram's uh, suggestion, you are going opposite way and jumping in and, and making a great impact right there. So what's your thought? You know, uh, my, my observation is you come from very different background uh, from many folks already in the battery field. Uh, and then you tackle the problem from different angle. Uh, that's my thought, you know, observation, but share with uh, everybody, right? particularly young students. Sure. Um, this is a great question. I'm happy to share a little about my journey. So actually, Ram and I have been working in the same field, uh, different parts of it. Um, Ram is the editor of Solid State Ionics, and this is where I was trained. I study point defects in material. So when I came to Stanford, actually, I didn't work on batteries at all. I was inspired by UE to work on batteries. Um, I think there are several important things to consider here. I'm always very curious about understandings of processes and materials. So the first thing I did on the layer oxide is I read all the papers and 
see what all the understandings are. And then I became curious. I said, well, what if this is not true? Or what if there's a better explanation? So I think being guided by one's own curiosity is very important. Then I think I also took the same um, approach as, as Ram and you advised, which is, well, we need to take a creative approach, right? Even though you're curious, you won't get to the answer if you just take the same approach as everyone else. So there I saw an opportunity to develop characterization method and theoretical methods to try to understand these processes a little bit better. And as I showed in the talk, it is possible actually to get very good and interesting understanding if you're willing to dig deeply. Um, so I'm always a believer that as the digger you deep, there's always something new there. Even though, you know, we take a very classical material, NMC, or you take a very classical material, lithium iron phosphate, there's just always a huge amount of richness um, that always surprises me. And I'm sure 10 years from now, someone else can also dig even deeper and find something that we haven't seen or come up with a better explanation. So I think my guiding principle is always uh, never be satisfied with the explanations we have. Maybe there are better ones. And try to think of new ways you can approach the problem, not just doing it the same way uh, as before. And I think these are necessary for innovation. And then I also want to mention very briefly, and I think this is also highlighted in Ram's talk, it's really important to work with others in the field, both academically and industrially, to understand what the real problems are. So I really benefited from working with industry. They really tell me the important problems they're experiencing, and I combine that with an academic understanding, and that helps me to approach the problem in a more comprehensive way. That's very good. Um... So let, let, let me summarize a little bit. I think three things you, you are sharing with us, this is highly valuable. Well, RAM, right, it's interdisciplinary, chemi chemistry, physics, I think multi-background, I also will to, to a certain extent, you learn from industry, the problem. I think this needs to be cross a boundary. Number two, Ram, I think I appreciate that. I'm taking your approach uh, is uh, going, moving into an area that's not so crowded. Uh, when I move into the area, not so crowded yet. So, and where you are teaching us the third one is, uh, you know, your perspective coming from different perspective, different approach, think deeply about it. That could also can lead to success. So with that, I think I would like to conclude today's uh, symposium. Thank you so much for two of you really amazing jobs right here. Uh, will be in two weeks. So next Friday, we don't have it. So in two weeks, August uh, 7th, the same time, 7 o'clock, um, by uh, two also outstanding speakers, Professor Vanessa Wood and uh, Dr. Robert Kostakit. Uh, I'll see everybody in two weeks. Bye now.